Hi everybody, thank you, welcome back. This is our, uh, our last session, but we've left, left the um, the best for last. Uh, it gives me great, we talked about um, solutions for SMEs in the previous uh, panel. We're now going to move to the uh, older generation, that's me. Um, we've become much more tech savvy, we've caught up during the pandemic. Um, so do we need um, uh, do we need the services, products and services geared towards uh, this generation? This will be answered in this panel. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to, um, to introduce uh, Ira, Ira Sobel, who um, is, is, a, is a, an academic in this area. And we have uh, a panel of very esteemed, of highly esteemed uh, panelists who will uh, share their thoughts with you. So I'm going to get off the stage and hand over to Ira. Thank you very much, guys, and see you all. Uh, thank you, Johnny, and we're really excited being here. It's the first time that in the fintech community, in the uh, fintech week Tel Aviv, we have a panel on fintech for aging, meaning that everyone knows and sees now the big opportunities of addressing aging and older adults through fintech. And uh, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm uh, Dr. Ira Sobel. I'm the founder of CEO and CEO of Fintech for Longevity. I uh, established this business a year ago based on the uh, findings of my PhD. And um, we are a consulting and a knowledge uh, company. And the mission is to see how Fintech can help improve the financial well-being of aging and older adults. We have today four panelists uh, representing each one of them, uh, both challenges and opportunities of a longer life. And uh, Claire Altman is the uh, Chief Corporate Officer from, of uh, Smart Pension in the UK. Rachel Kaplan is the CEO and uh, COO and founder of Sage. Sergey Balasanyan is the co founder and CEO of uh, Longevity Card. And Rowena here is uh, both the founder and CEO of Assured Allies. Um, so we have here there's uh, uh, four speakers, and in a minute they will introduce themselves and themselves and their, their companies. Um, so we are speaking today about four challenges and opportunities of aging. So Rachel represents the uh, gig economy for retirees or the opportunity of late life employment. Sergey is representing the health aspect of wealth or health is the new wealth. As people live longer, the proportion of the healthy life expectancy is increasing as well. And Roir represents the new trend of aging in place, which means that people choose, all the people choose more and more to stay at home, probably even more after uh, the pandemic. And uh, um, uh, Claire from Smart Pension is about how longevity is going to be financed, fi finance, uh, longevity is going to be financed and what is the role of technology or more specifically of robo retirement in recommendations for uh, retirement? So let's start, please, with uh, questions. So, Rachel from Sage, I'd like to start with you, please. Um, can you please tell us what are the biggest opportunities in your perspective? for late life em employment and how do you encourage younger adults to work with their older counterparts? Sure. So first of all, thank you very much for having us here today. To answer that question, I'll just give a bit of an introduction to myself. My name is Rachel Kaplan. I'm co-founder at Sage based in Tel Aviv. Uh, Sage is the world's first gig economy platform for retirees. To monetize their life experience, we offer a marketplace of social learning experiences that are hosted by expert retirees. So we have really two bold ob objectives here. One is to financial and social wellness for retirees. And the other is to democratize access to life experience, skills, and knowledge. Sage was built out of a frustration that retirement is becoming increasingly unaffordable. Um, and the backwards idea that when someone retires, all the knowledge and the skills that they accumulated over a lifetime have nowhere to go. 
So we're trying to change that conversation around and turn that life experience into a resource and really a tradable commodity in a way that's win-win and it's interactive and disruptive all at the same time. So if you want to learn how to cook or play chess or plan a monthly budget, get some parenting advice or learn a new language, Sage can be the place for you. Um, so in terms of the question, what are the biggest opportunities in late life employment? Um, that part of the question, obviously we believe that that's with the gig economy. Now, I should clarify, there are obvious significant rights related issues when it comes to the gig economy, uh, but that's really the dark side of this market. In its essence, the gig economy is based on flexible, temporary or freelance work. Um, and it often involves connecting through some kind of online platform like what Sage is here to offer. The gig economy makes work more adaptable to the needs of the moment and the people and the demand for a flexible lifestyle that is often very prevalent, especially in retirement. The gig economy is the fastest growing work category in the world. So we're trying to make this category accessible to retirees who are the fastest growing demographic in the world. The other issue that I'll make a note of here is that there is rampant and, norm and normalized ageism in the workplace. And many people in their golden years either don't want the daily nine to five grind anymore. Um, and that is even if they could successfully land or keep a job. So the gig economy presents the opportunity for flexibility. And we match that with the skills and the knowledge that retirees have to share by turning age into an asset rather than a burden. Uh, the second part of the question was about how do we encourage younger people to engage with older counterparts? It's so a really let's good question and one that we get the, asked often. Um, uh, um, with Rui. Uh, Rui. Rui, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I think we're back. Rachel, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, sorry. I didn't realize that I cut out. <laughs> Okay, um, so, okay, just continue in two, three more uh, uh, sentences and then we uh, move on. Sure, um, so just to answer the question of how we encourage younger people to engage with older people is that we turn the engagement into an experience. We've seen studies that show that 78% of millennials are more likely to spend money on an experience rather than stuff. Um, so we turn sages or the retirees, not just into teachers, but into hosts where younger people are incentivized to engage, not just because they're going to learn something, but because they're going to have a fun and a meaningful time doing so. And they're also able to meet other people. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. great. Um, okay. Now I'd like please to ask uh, Roy, um, Roy about the trend of uh, aging in place. Uh, my question is, how is the trend, this trend impacting the opportunity for insurance companies and how uh, do they see their involvement in the day-to-day -day life of elderly people? Okay, thank you for the question. I'll start with a quick introduction. So I'm the uh, co-founder and CEO of Okay, Shuret. so um, I think that Roy lost connection as, as well. Roy, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Okay. So uh, thank you, and I really apologize. I don't know what's going on here. So I think, Claire, probably we move on. Can you hear me? I can, but I could also hear Roe. So yeah, I, I, I think, think I... it's you, Ira. Are you here, Roe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, Roe, can you hear me? Because I see that he lost connection. So probably, yeah, um, I can, hear you. Uh, can, can you hear me? Yeah. Roy, you. can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let me start with a quick intro and then I'll try to answer your question. I hope the connection will help. Uh, so I'm the CEO uh, and co-founder of Assured Airlines. Assured Airlines is the uh, successful aging company. So we're using technology to transform the trajectory of aging. So we're empowering older adults to age longer in their homes. Um, and it's very much similar to what happens, for example, in healthcare. Uh, in I'm healthcare, sorry, probably it's... Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. So it's like in healthcare, mm -hmm. where your primary care physician is your champion. Roy, can you hear me? Because I can't, I can't hear you or you're... you're... Yeah. I can hear you loud and clear. So, uh, Claire, probably we move on with you. So, um, 
I can hear you and can you hear me? I can, but um, Ira, we can all <laughs> we can all hear Rowie, and he it sounded quite interesting. So, could we not just? I don't know. We Ira, I think I said I think uh, me and Sergey can certainly hear Rowie. I think so. We can if 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 it works, we can. Thank we, you, Claire. Yeah, and we just let him carry on. Thank you. I appreciate it, Claire. So I'll give it another try. I hope I can hear me. Okay, so I will ask a question and probably Roy and probably you repeat my question. <laughs> I don't know because I I don't see him. It's written that he lost uh, connection. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. Uh, so let me try to take on, continue on the question. Um, so what I was saying is that like you have in healthcare where your primary care physician is your champion in you know, being healthy. And as you have in finance, where your investment manager, or your wealth manager, or family office, they're your champion in being wealthy. Our allies are the seniors champions in staying um, in successful aging, right? So our first product is a program that helps seniors who have long-term care insurance age in place. So we actually partnered with the long-term care insurers and we provide their members with services like interventions and clinically proven services that are designed to help them age longer in their homes. Things like home modifications to prevent falls or hearing aids to prevent or delay dementia or uh, Alzheimer's specific protocols that are designed to help the senior age longer in their homes. The seniors are getting this, all of this for free and we are charging the insurance companies for the reduction in the claims and the payouts, uh, which is a win for all. Uh, and you can think about it in a way that we are investing $100 in grab bars to prevent $100,000 of claims. Right, so that's what we do. And then, uh, Ira, going back to a question about aging in place as an opportunity for insurance companies in terms of engagement, I think that um, first there's an assumption where people actually don't want to go to a nursing home or to a facility and age in place. And I think that's very much true, especially given everything that happened with COVID. And I think that we need to make a distinction as we talk about insurers between two groups. There are the long-term care insurers, the traditional long-term care insurers, and then there's the um, life and annuity insurers. And I think that for the long-term care insurers, traditionally, they, some of them did, but most of them don't really do a good job at engagement to the extent that some of them don't even have the phone numbers of their members. Like if you ask them, if you look at their CRM, they have like the name and the address, but they don't even have a phone number. So it's really hard to maintain engagement like that. And I think that this realization that there's a potential win for all in helping them, helping their members age in place, which is a good thing, both for the member, but also for the insurance company and for the bottom line. So it's a double bottom line. I think that's a great opportunity for them to catch up on that engagement deficit that they have. And I think that for the annuity and life insurers, uh, engagement could actually be, be a very dramatic in terms of retention. So you can think about like if you have, people have multiple um, uh, financial instruments, so they can have multiple annuities, for example, and they are less likely to cash out an annuity that provides added value services. So an annuity that helps, annuity designed for seniors that help them age in place is probably going to benefit for a much, much better retention than any other annuity. Um, mm -hmm. And so this is why we are partnering with those insurance companies to provide those kind of added value services and help them improve their engagement with their policyholders. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, uh, great uh, answer. Thank you. So we see that uh, aging in place is uh, older people. They really need engagement to speak to someone, and they need they need a human interaction. Um, so now I'm moving to ask Claire because this is robo retirement, and which is less human that uh, that uh, less human, of course. Um, so Claire, there's a trend in the pension industry to help people make better decision for retirement using digi uh, digitization. And recently we hear more about gamification and goal setting in the process of robo retirement. So, in your perspective, what is the role of technology in navigating retirement, and what are the tools that Smart Pension is deploying to help both with the complexity and improve the financial futures of uh, aging adults? Well, thanks, Ira, and also thanks, Rowie. So, I think 
I did the right thing letting you speak because you set me up very nicely. So I um, appreciate that. I appreciate that very much. So um, a few words first about SMART. SMART started in the UK in, the, in 2015 and was a response to uh, legislation that came in here, which required every company to offer a pension scheme for their staff. So this is following the Dan Daniel Kahneman School of Thinking, which is rather um, put everyone in the pension scheme, even if they don't know, and if they don't like it, then then they will um, come out rather than um, you know try and communicate with them and encourage them and so on to get them in, which was a, a much harder thing to do. So it's it's been an incredibly successful policy in the UK. There's now 10 million people with with savings that they would not otherwise have. So Smart came along as a te technology solve to the challenge that um, SMEs were going to face, which was. I don't have a, an HR department. I haven't got, you know, uh, 15 people lined up to sort out this pension arrangement for my staff. I just, I just want to get compliant. What do I do? So Smart built um, a very easy portal that allowed companies in in a matter of minutes just to sign up all of their staff and uh, and be compliant with these new requirements for offering pension arrangements for their staff. Um, so that so that's a, a bit of background. Um, for smart, which I think is helpful when just thinking about then what do we do with these people who a lot of them don't even know that they've got a pension arrangement or you know savings that are going to help them in retirement. How do you even begin to talk to them um, about what they should be doing in retirement? So that that's broadly the challenge that we that we face um, together with another challenge, which is that the pots of money are not overly large, so you don't necessarily want to use the money for um, expensive financial advice. In the UK, it's often, it is often expensive to, as you say, Ira, get to, to speak to somebody. So, so can, can we then use technology to, to bridge that gap? And so what SMART has done is come, come at it again from a behavioral finance point of view and thought about the different ways that people would, would engage with the, with the, uh, the user journey effectively and built around four personas and those per personas um, developed really from a point of view of knowledge. So so at one extreme, somebody who knows a lot and understands a lot, and at the other extreme, <clears throat> somebody who doesn't know, you know, doesn't even know the questions to ask. And so so the the user journeys had to had to be able to bridge um, both of the all all of that spectrum of knowledge and and so through um, months of research broadly, we have, we have then put together um, a, a guided user journey that will, that will, cover, will cover everybody. And um, there's um, uh, interactive education, so if people want to know more, they can. But similarly, if they don't want to know anymore and they just want it all done for them, then, then that's, um, it, they're guided that way as well. And lastly, um, begin to, we begin to use nudges. So when people are coming up to thinking about retirement, that's the time when we start trying to engage them. So we do try and engage them, but we also accept that a lot of people will just will just not be interested. They, they're not interested in pensions. I think we've got 23 people in this session. I don't know. I don't know if if that's because it's retirement and aging, but but often often there just is a lack of interest. Um, perfectly understandable. People don't want to think about getting old, I don't think very much. Um, so so our, what we've built effectively um, kind of cr crosses those two, those two areas. What, one really for people who are engaged and want to know and want to make decisions and so on, but equally respecting the thinking of the, the idea behind auto-enrollment in the first place, uh, assuming that a lot of people actually are not interested and yet still deserve as good outcome as, as they can have. Uh, great. So can you just uh, add something about gamification and goal setting? How do you, your, how smart uh, helps people uh, or encourage what is called intrinsic motivation or help people to be more aware of their uh, uh, pensions and the importance of their economic spending in late life. Do you use gamification or deploy goal setting in your solutions? Well, well we do. And so, so this is what I was beginning to talk about in terms of, of nudging and the, 
the thinking um, and and where we are with this is 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 still is still kind of a work in progress. But but uh -huh. but one hundred percent exactly that that um, um, for those that are interested. Um, and as I say, we kind of begin to get people interested through nudging, nudges yeah. and so on. Um, they can begin to think about what does their retirement, mm -hmm. what could their retirement look like? What could it look like if they if they put more money in um, at that at that earlier stage? Because obviously, mm -hmm. with with something like this, the more the more it, it it's it's a factor of time as much as anything else. The earlier you start putting money in, um, the the better, really. So, mm -hmm. so okay. I, I, Okay, thank you very much. Now, um, Sergey, now we are uh, giving you the stage. So, where we speak about interest, intrinsic motivation, both in terms of uh, accumulated savings or encouraging people to do more exercise, for example. So, uh, recently we heard more and more the phrase that health is the new wealth. So, what does that mean in the era of uh, longevity? And to what extent does longevity card succeed in increasing people's motivation to do more exercise, for example? And how are they financially rewarded for this? Uh, thank you very much, Aram. Uh, thanks for having me today. My name is Sergei Balsanyan. I'm co-founder and CEO of Longevity Card. So uh, we are the first fintech which combines health and wealth. And as you told, health is the new wealth. It's our motto. And uh, generally speaking, <clears throat> I, I can uh, tell that we have uh, a pipeline of products. So the first product is exactly uh, what you were talking about. It's a uh, integration of fintech and M health. So what does it mean? Uh, if we take it very easy. Just imagine a Revolut or Monzo or any other challenger bank from a fintech side. But from a health tech side, it uh, first of all, it, we have a longevity marketplace. This means a marketplace of health, fitness, wellness related products and services started from uh, private clinics ending with yoga studios and pet uh, like pet life insurances, etc. So uh, we provide uh, discounts for our users in order to motivate them to like um, go to our vendors to improve their health. And moreover, we have a mobile health integration, which means we track daily fitness activity. So for example, we put your goals. If you do 10,000 steps per day, you got increased cashback or discounts. So it's some kind of why we're doing it, because first of all, bank should care about not only financial health of uh, their clients, but also uh, about their real physical health, because uh, they are very related. And the second product in our pipeline, which will be released after half a year, and uh, moreover, we partnered with one of the biggest UK uh, national research universities to develop this seamless product for 60 plus uh, generation. So what does it mean? It means that mobile banking will be as much easy as uh, like, you know, the phone with big numbers on it uh, for a senior generation. So it will be as much easy as this phone. We uh, can't yet disclose what university it is and some details, but in any way, uh, our aim is to stop the ageism in the banking industry and to make financial inclusion because mm -hmm. the senior generation is the most undervalued and uh, excluded uh, from financial system generation. Okay, so this is the very interesting. So you're saying something about a baby bank probably that will be born soon, a baby, a baby bank or a bank for baby boomers that will address everything that will help older adults to be uh, in a better financial inclusion as they are today. But now I'm on, I want to move a little bit about uh, one of the big problems of uh, uh, older adults with technology, which is the problem of trust. So I'd like to ask you, please, Rory, let's start with you. 
As we know that one of the major barriers in addressing older adults is the challenge of building trust over time with, with older people. So how do you in, in uh, Assured Allies, how do you address this, the problem or the challenge of trust in your initiative? Yes, thank you. I think it's a, it's a very good question. I think trust and credibility is a very big issue. Uh, our strategy there was is built from two parts. The first part is the foot in the door, which is we partner with insurance companies and we, in some ways, borrow some of their credibility. Right? So the insurance companies have invested billions of dollars in building a brand, and the policyholders have been paying for those insurance companies thousands of dollars for many, many years. So when we approach them, we, when we initially approach them and onboard the seniors to our platform, we do that we, together with the insurance companies, and that really helps uh, to get very good engagement, initial engagement methods. Mm -hmm. But then the challenge becomes, how do we justify that initial trust? Right? So they trusted us for the first conversation, they're willing to talk to us, what's next? And we believe that our strategy, at least, is we believe in a non-transactional relationship. So we believe that when the senior, in, in our case, we have these allies as champions of successful aging. So we designate an ally to a, to a member. Right, so when the, when the member, when the senior has issues and they pick up the phone and call us, they get the same ally. And we're using technology to empower those allies, to support them to actually maintain and to scale that relationship on, on many, many, many seniors. Right? So when, when somebody is calling, they have all the information at hand with all the previous conversation and all the information structure in a way that they can digest and use to build that relationship. So to sum it up, we believe both in borrowing, borrowing and leveraging our partners' credibility and then maintaining a non-transactional ongoing relationship with the seniors. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, this is very interesting. And of course, trust goes hand in hand with scalability. And I would like to ask you, Rachel, about the how do you build in the uh, gig economy of the, or how do you build trust with the elderly people who uh, can um, uh, give or provide from their accumulated experiences and knowledge to younger people in your platform? Sure. Uh, well, first and foremost, we built SAGE for people in our own lives and our families. So that process builds trust indirectly because if it's not good enough for our parents or our grandparents, then it's not good enough for the customer either. Um, in addition, so far, we've actually given 100% of the revenues directly into the pockets um, of our retiree users. Um, as these have been our very loyal early adopters um, who have really stuck with us and returned to the platform again and again, even as we've pivoted and adapted to the pandemic. So this has certainly helped us to earn and to keep their trust. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And today, what about trust in the uh, longevity card? How do you build trust with your uh, customers? So, uh, generally speaking, I'm always telling that uh, lack of trust is lack of uh, education. So, what does it mean that now our like grandparents didn't trust WhatsApp? until uh, we and like explained how it works and uh, in a very easy and warm way. So um, just um, like an amazing example, uh, there is a Russian um, cell phone company uh, like a cell operator. So uh, for each elderly client, they made a brochure in the form of book and video. And after that, the rate of uh, mobile internet penetration in their network among the 60 plus generation, like increased exponentially. So uh, first of all, of course, it's a right way to explain what is mobile banking and why you should trust it. And that it's uh, like your savings are um, protected by financial conduct authority, etc. but in a very easy manner. So, and the second thing, of course, for the elderly product, we will have video support, which will give them uh, some kind of physical presence. So until uh, they will not get used um, mm -hmm. to, to the technology. So yeah, those are like two, two short points about okay. it. Uh, great. So now we, after we speak about the customers' uh, perspectives, 
Um, the next question is, what, is the, what do you think is the ideal go-to-market strategy for fintechs addressing older adults? Is it B2C or B2B2C? And why did you choose your path in your uh, platform? So, Claire, can we start with you, please? Yeah, so um, as I was saying before, SMART was a response to legislation in the UK which was aimed at businesses. So SMART initially has actually always been B to B to C, um, but that was that was because we were we took an opportunity that there was in the UK. I think the advantage of going B to B is scale, um, because you know for each business that we take on as a client or uh, as we're a platform business for each um, platform client we have. Um, we we access scale a lot more easily, and certainly in the world of um, retirement benefits, um, there's not a lot of money to go round to feed all of the various um, um, institutions and so on that, that are involved in the journey. So so margins are generally small. So so we need scale. We needed scale. We need scale. And so for us, kind of the B two B to C play is is definitely mm -hmm. going to be. The, the way forward. I mean, as, as far as other people are concerned, obviously it's going to depend on on the business model, the proposition, and mm. and so on. But um, certainly for us, it's it's by far the um, the most you know optimal. Mm -hmm. So Sergey, would you say that B two B is the in the long run the ideal go to market strategy? But starting probably with the B two C and then moving on to B two B two C. What is your uh, thoughts about it? Um, I can tell you in such a way that, of course, every company has its own strategy and everyone is pursuing their own like uh, targets. For us, uh, I can tell that, first of all, we are launching with B2C. And uh, with in regards to B2B, why we are always like uh, also targeting this model because uh, first of all, we are building uh, an ecosy uh, longevity ecosystem. So our B2B is not only about um, like commercial relations. Yeah, it's also about to like we have a mission to help companies who are working mm -hmm. in longevity field, in age tech field, health tech field, to scale very fast. So, for example, just a little hint, uh, we give discount on B2B to longevity focused companies, for example, in fundraising, in uh, accountancy, etc. So we help a lot uh, these companies to uh, like to scale cost effective mm -hmm. and like to help them. And of course, uh, the second thing that when you are building a B2B ecosystem, of course, it's uh, helping a lot to gain trust because uh, 60 plus generation can trust companies who are on your marketplace. And while right. we are doing cross promotion, of course, you are gaining additional trust. Mm -hmm. That's, by the way, back to the question about the trust. Yeah. Um, okay, so thank you for this. And I would like to ask about the uh, one of the big uh, challenges of aging is the gender aspect. And we know that P uh, women accumulate less for retirement as of many, many explanations, one of which is their different careers than men, risk of adversity, but also um, their average life expectancy, which is uh, on average five years more than men. So Claire, you're in the uh, <clears throat> you're in the retirement area, and addressing the gender gap in pension, for example, what is your perspective? Is there a way that technology or digitization uh, do they have the potential to narrow at least partially this the gender gap in accumulation of uh, pensions? I mean, I, th I think using the principles that I was outlining earlier, there definitely is potential. So, so um, if you take the majority of women that I know, um, and this is sweeping, sweeping generalizations, um, so um, not meaning to offend anybody, but, mo but most uh, women I know are, are not interested. They're not interested and 
um, they don't have the understanding um, and they don't want to get the understanding. You know, they generally speaking, it's it's not something they want to engage with. So so really, mm -hmm. it's, it's it's the same as the engagement question, I think, that I was talking about mm -hmm. earlier, so that, that mm -hmm. by, by solving some of the engagement challenges that we have, um, by that you will you will help um, close the close the gender gap. And then I mm -hmm. think once you've engaged people, you can start to say things like, you know, if you're going on maternity leave, think about the fact that you won't be earning during this period, not only from a salary perspective, but also from a savings perspective. Also, you know, if you're thinking about going back to work or not, um, or going back part time, don't just think of it as for now, you know, and the money you'll earn over the next kind of however many yeah. years, but, but also into retirement. And if you've solved that engagement challenge, then then you much then much more able then to um, carry that through into into all these areas. But but um, using the guidance that the technology behind the guidance that we've that we've built effectively is is getting us kind of 80 percent there. But I think that's addressing engagement as a whole. And then yeah. there's a there's an additional piece on top that I think could be focused, could be focused for women. Um, I mean, you know, there's obviously much more that can be done in the in society to help women stay at work yeah. jobs so, that they want to do for longer, but obviously for another session, another time. So I I totally agree with you that technology has the potential to narrow this gap, but there of course uh, it's very challenging and depending how uh, it's going to be uh, done. So I think we're now at the stage of Q and A, and if somebody wants to ask a question, so please write it down in the uh, Q&A part. Uh, I, at the moment, I don't see any questions. So probably I will ask another question which I would, which I would like to ask Roy. And in the meantime, if one of the people in the audience have any questions to one of the panelists or to me, so you're invited to write it in the uh, Q&A. Um, so, Roy, um, <clears throat> when we speak about longevity, so longevity risk and longevity financing are usually at the core of these discussions. Mm -hmm. So, what are you, what tools are you using in order to measure their longevity risk? Yes, so I, I think that there's some misconception in the way people perceive the longevity risk. I think many people okay. look at it as the I think many people look at it as the risk of people living longer than expected. But I think it's not just about life expectancy per se, but also disability-free life expectancy. So it's more than just the chance of somebody, the exact chance of somebody reaching 85 years old, but it's a question whether that person is going to have like five years of dementia or not. That really influences the longevity risk in the more holistic form. And I think that for that, you need more than just statistical or actual data because you need to look at the specific healthcare related data, family caregiving related data, et cetera. So we invest a lot of energy in collecting those data points and using sophisticated methods to predict not just the aging, not just the, the life expectancy, but also the, the, the healthcare and uh, disability related risks. Okay, so this is very interesting. For example, we know that in Israel, which has a very high life expectancy, especially for men, so about 87% of men's life expectancy, they're healthy or disability-free, and the rest 13%, uh, they are they are they have disabilities. So uh, you think that longevity risk probably has to be calculated for a healthy life expectancy or disability-free mm -hmm. life expectancy, and not to the overall life expectancy, or to measure both. In it other depends on the use there. case, but yes. Depends on the use yeah. case. If you are, yeah, if if you are a long-term care insurer, for example, then you care about that. Yeah. If you are, if if you if you if the benefit spending on the on the you know situation of the senior, then you know, it really depends on the disability-free life expectancy. If if it's mm -hmm. even from the personal standpoint, if I'm thinking about my pension and my budget, I need to understand, you know, it, if I need to support memory care or not, it really changes the cost structure. So I think mm -hmm. disability-free is a big factor that a lot of time people kind of miss and focus just on the life expectancy. Okay, great. Um, so I think that we have another one minute. So Rachel, in one word, um, what is the golden tip for entrepreneur who want to engage with the uh, older adults? Just one word or one tip, that the golden tip that you can give uh, 
some I don't think I can do it in I don't know if I can say it in one word, but my one tip is that if you're building something for older people and a week or maximum a month goes by where you don't see or interact with an older person, then something isn't right. So make sure that you're getting out there and really speaking to the people that you're trying to build for. Right. So you're speaking about the product market fit, and this is, uh, of course, very, very important when we speak about all the results. Okay. So um, this is the end. Thank you very much. Thank you for all the participants. I hope you enjoyed the panel, and uh, see you soon, or see you next year in the uh, next, uh, in our next uh, uh, fintech week. And thank you very much, Johnny for having us thank here. You, thank you guys um thank you that was uh, that was fantastic i uh, i definitely think it's a discipline that will um be an integral part of uh, of uh, fintech um fintech conferences and academia for, for years to come uh, as we said earlier um the older generation have caught up and uh, we, we we need uh products and services too and um this that generation has the capital as well so it makes sense uh, um, thank you so much, Ira. Uh, we've um, we've obviously been in, in touch for many a month, and it's been a, a pleasure working with you. Thank you for bringing in um, and helping bring in such a uh, a great great panel. Um, uh, Claire, thank you very much. Um, Sergey, uh, also thank you very much. Uh, and Rachel and Rui, really really appreciate. And I apologize, your, I apologize about the disconnections at, at the beginning. Yeah. Probably it was my fault. I don't know, but something went wrong. But then. So I really apologize if it if it wasn't my side. No, no, no. It, it was all it was all good. It was all